Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining our fifth episode of CPA to CFO, uh, the podcast where we try to help the CPA community with their career and get advice on how to really move into that CFO role. Um, for some context, my name is Mike Whitmire. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Flowcast. My background's in accounting, and I would have wanted to become a CFO if I had stayed in that space, right? But in founding Flowcast, I realized I, I really didn't know what a CFO does. Um, I've been fortunate enough to learn it, and I kind of wanted to double down on that learning by starting this podcast and sharing this information with the uh, accounting community at large. So that's the background, that's my background. And today we have Gabby Loeb uh, from Play Versus on the, uh, the podcast today. I'm super excited to have you on board. Um, could you give just like a quick introduction to yourself, little, little overview? Sure, um, my name is Gabby. Uh, I've been in the finance and strategy world here in LA for the last 20 plus years. Um, first at, uh, in consulting and then some a few big public companies and then about eight years ago moved into the startup world and uh, haven't looked back. So that's awesome. kind of super high level. Yeah, cool. And you want to give a little pitch for Play Versus before we just hop into business? Sure. No, I'd love to. So I've been at Play yeah. Versus about seven months. Play Versus is building the infrastructure for amateur esports. So really uh, esports being competitive video game playing um, there's very large and fairly well-developed professional leagues at this point, even though it's a fairly nascent industry, but there's really no amateur ecosystem. So we are starting at the high school level and we've created a software infrastructure to allow high schools uh, and high school students to play these games in leagues and really treat it like a sport, like any other high school sport. Um, we have great partnerships with some key people in the high school world, uh, the NFHS, which is akin to the NCAA for high school, as well as some key state associations. And then we work really closely with the publishers to make their games available to high school students. Man, that's really, that's this, the esports world is just so interesting. When I was a kid, you were weird if you wanted to pay, play like Madden for, for money or whatever. Um, times have changed. I kind of wish I grew up now. But, yeah, likewise, likewise. Yeah. All right, anyway, let's, uh, let's kick into business to uh, make sure we're using everyone's time wisely here. So for today, I just wanna walk through your career and, and take it from the top and really think about, you know, discuss valuable lessons you've, you've kind of learned along the way. So um, you started your career in the consulting world. So let's, uh, let's start there. Yeah, so um, I actually started my, my career in Washington, D.C. at a public policy think tank, but um, realized I was not gonna be a, a, a researcher or PhD candidate. So I moved to LA and started in consulting. I worked at a company called LEK Consulting. We were the kind of the West Coast office at the time. This is the late 90s. And therefore I got a lot of great exposure in strategy management consulting to entertainment, media, and technology. We were, we were doing all the internet work for the most part for LEK uh, here in LA. And, and so I got- Sorry, sorry to cut you off. In the late yeah, no '90s, like you were, what what companies were you working with at that point? So we were working with uh, a lot of the big studios and music labels. Who at this point, you know, music labels were fighting against Napster and trying to figure out what their digital strategies would be. The studios were doing the same thing. They were trying to figure out what could they do with digital distribution, whether that was for television or primarily for movies. Um, all this was fairly nascent. And then on the internet side, we worked for all kinds of interesting companies. Um, you know, some of the biggest, uh, at the time, a bunch of the big search engines, some of which are not around anymore, Right. Um, you know, and just helping a lot of companies figure out what their internet strategy should be, whether it's large retailers, uh, some, uh, you know, bricks and mortar retail, trying to figure out how to go into e-commerce. So, you know, it was, it was pretty interesting times. And I loved that whole, um, the meeting of media and technology and, and what it could mean for uh, creating new business models. I really kind of found that fascinating. Yeah, and, and obviously in the perfect spot in, in LA for that. And so you, so you were helping develop the strategy in conjunct with your clients to, okay, that's really, that's really cool. Yeah, so, so I was there, uh, left there, went to business school um, over on the East Coast. I was at Harvard for a couple Gabby of years. went to Harvard, yeah. You're being, I, yeah. I thought you were going to be modest there, but yeah, Gabby went to Harvard. I, I usually get, I usually get uh, yelled at when I just say I went to school on the East Coast. So I went to school at Harvard. It was great. Uh, it was a very interesting time because I applied and got in right before the stock market crashed in 2000. So my timing was quite good, as it turned out. Yeah. Um, so great two years and I moved back here right after school 
and really wanted to get into the entertainment world. Took a job at Disney uh, in the studio. So I took a job with someone who I actually had worked with when I was in consulting. And he was the CFO of the animation studio. So that was feature animation, which made the movies, as well as the TV animation and direct-to-video businesses. So uh, his name was Duncan Oral Jones, and he was kind of my first uh, CFO boss. I came in and it was the kind of a, I'm going to be a general manager like they teach you at business school. Uh, and I quickly kind of fell in love with the idea of what finance and analytics re could really do uh, for an organization and how I could contribute in that way. So yeah. that was kind of my first foray into uh, a finance path myself. And and this is, I think, important for the audience to note. Did you, so you came in and you were working for someone you had worked for previously. Did you like interview? Was there a resume prep? Did you go through a formal so process? This was me, um, you know, the context of when I was coming out of school, it was right after 9-11. So it was that year. And, um, you know, the stock markets were crazy. And so a lot of people went back to their old jobs. And I had no interest in going back to consulting, even right. though it was a great experience. And so I had reached out to... Uh, Duncan, because I had done my internship the summer before, and I basically begged my way into a job. So, <laughs> um, but it was, there was no role. And so he kind of carved out a piece of a role for me so he could just get me into the company. Um, and it, it was quite literally a foot in the door type of job. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I just love noting that for the audience because the career pathing path is about finding people who enjoy working with you and they pull you into their next companies and it's much easier. And so, while he didn't pull you in, he was open to creating a whole opportunity for you, which, which speaks That's volumes. Right. That's so, right. So what kind of stuff did you learn at Disney? So, you know, my role was really kind of a strategy and finance role. So, you know, I, I was kind of his right hand in terms of thinking through things like, hey, we are still making 2D animated film. How do we start creating CG animation while still finishing 2D? So kind of, you know, rebuilding the plane while you're flying it. Um, right. What does that look like? Um, what kind? You know, we had multiple animation studios around the world. Were they efficient? What should we do with them? And then, really, a lot of internal planning and so budgeting, forecasting, working with the studio groups and production groups within the animation group to kind of understand um, how we could look at uh, the data to make smart decisions. So he, his focus, and this is something that stuck with me since, was really around decision support. Finance is um, is a service organization for the organ uh, for for the company and for leadership across the company, and you know we were there to help them make good decisions. And That's since we had the data and we could help them analyze it, um, we were well placed to be able to do that. And I, I've heard just to kind of double down on that, I've heard others refer to the finance and accounting function as kind of the Switzerland of the company, and they're the ones who independently are just going to say, you know, we support this decision or not based on the data and sounds yeah, like you're validating I, I that, think right? that's right. I also think what it means is that finance um, and, and accounting as well, really, the, the organizations can really be thought of as a part of the organization. It's not a, uh, you don't throw it over the wall and wait for an answer. It's, you know, it, it requires much more integration, understanding the key business drivers and what makes each department tick and, you know, why some decisions are good and some decisions are bad, you know, if you have that context, then you can help um, analyze in a different way and you can also help gather different data and then you can really help the organization make smart decisions along the way. Makes uh, perfect sense. Okay, cool. Well, moving along to uh, Macrovision here. Yeah, so I, I, I left Disney after, um, after Disney bought Pixar uh, most of the people I worked for left the company and I eventually got a job at uh, basically it was Gemstar TV Guide, which was then bought out by Macrovision, which then became Rovi and TiVo along the way. But okay. I, I took a job at Gemstar TV Guide in, in the corporate finance role. I was really excited because the team was planning on doing M&A and they had a whole bunch of cash on their balance sheet and I wanted to learn more about that. Uh, and little did I know about a month into the job, I, I went to go work for a guy named Mark Rosenbaum, who's another mentor of mine and still a very close friend. Uh, we were all very excited to do M&A. A month in, we found out that actually we needed to sell the company. Um, there were some interesting ownership structures and uh, one of the key owners was News Corp. 
And I think they were trying, at the time, I think they were interested in buying Dow Jones, which eventually happened, of course. So uh, as part of that, and the company was doing really well, they said, you know, why don't we try to sell? And so we actually, we did M&A, not exactly the way I thought we would, but um, yeah. <laughs> we ended up selling the company in Macrovision. Uh, it was a really successful, it was a, I think a two and a half billion dollar deal. Uh, really interesting, really hard year, because we were also at the same time trying to operate the business, which was right. kind of game busters. So, um, really fun and interesting and that to me what, what uh, a lot of what I learned there was about uh, how to create accountability within the organization not only within finance and accounting um, but also across the organization you know my my role in corporate finance was not just around m a and kind of high level uh, you know fp a but also really to work with key departments uh, product engineering marketing to um, to really help them uh, budget and forecast. So it kind of goes back a little bit to this, the, to the decision support that we talked about earlier, right. but also really focusing in and around accountability, which then, I mean, when I got to Zephyr, that was also something really key, but focused around uh, budgeting, forecasting, how to think about giving people the tools so that they can, um, they can not only drive the decision making, but, uh, but really understand the things that they impact and the things that their organizations impact. Yeah, and, and this is a working across departments is definitely a theme that's been coming up here. Um, do you have any you know tactical advice for for how you can do that? And I think maybe more importantly, like how you hold people accountable to to getting their work done and providing you with what you need. Yeah, so across the company, um, so outside of the the organizations that I manage or have been a part of, um, I, I think it's really a um, a willingness to jump in and listen. Um, it's one of those things that sounds really simple. It's a lot harder to do, especially if you have opinions about things, but to really mm -hmm. get in there and understand what makes each part of the organization uh, thrive and what the issues are and, and really try to find out ways that you can actually help. I think that's, that's what's so important to create a, a real collaboration so that, you know, I think a lot of people think of the finance organization as the place where things go to die, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I ask to do something and they say, no, you know, it's not in the budget or whatever. And so the, the question is like, how do you, how do you create um, transparency, communication, flexibility so that even if something's not in the budget, it doesn't mean it's a no, let's talk about it and understand why, is there something that needs to be added, et cetera. And around accountability, it's really about giving people um, ownership. And so um, one of the things I learned later at Zephyr was, you know, kind of top down versus bottoms up yeah. um, and you know the top down budgeting and forecasting there's very little accountability or ownership across the organization because you've just told them what they can do and right. even if you have good leadership and good managers that tone is really set and so um, trying to do something more from the bottoms up where feedback you know inputs come in from the organization and there's real ownership around hey you know here's what I asked for it doesn't mean that you get everything, but here's what I asked for. Here's why there's business cases attached to everything. Yeah. So when you get to it, it's not a, it's not a no, uh, it's, you know, even if it's something's out of scope or out of budget, it's a, well, what changed in the business such that we need to rethink things. And then it becomes a conversation and then there's ownership there. And so, um, it's not me making a decision on their behalf. It's being part of the conversation and that manager or leader owning those decisions. You know, that's um, the, I really like the idea of kind of, if I could put it in, in different words, I would say early on, you almost want to position yourself as the helper for other functions within there rather than being the blocker. So it's kind of a mentality switch up front. Um, and then when you're helping with the budgeting and forecasting more, more bottoms up, which I can tell you we're, we're doing that right now. You know, historically we've, we've, done our budgeting based on, Hey, here's, here's how we're going to hire next year. Here's what it right. is. And here's the number we want this year. You know, I just went to my team and said, Hey, we want to double go, go how figure out it. how we're going to do that. Yeah. And it's been, you know, watching everyone kind of run off and do their own thing has been, has been awesome to see. And it feels like that accountability is already. Yeah, it does. And don't get me wrong. That, that makes things somewhat messier and harder to manage on, on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, as you grow into that, I think it's like a, it's a, you know, it's, it's 
building skills and kind of building muscle for the organization so that you can scale, I think. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about, let's move on to, um, to Zephyr then. I mean, well, there are a couple, a couple other stops in the middle, but we're already starting to move on to Zephyr. So, yeah. well, quickly, um, I did work at the audience briefly, which is actually how we met. So, um, this is, yes. So this is one of the few, uh, job interviews where I did not get the job, uh, Gabi, but I, I feel somewhat better because if I remember this correctly, you were, wanted to hire me, but the CFO said, no, he doesn't have enough experience and just yeah. kind of blanket. No, based on my resume. That's right. And so, uh, I, I think still think if I could have gotten in front of him, <laughs> I would have made it happen, but you know, Hey, yeah, well, luckily I think this worked out, uh, this worked out for you. So, uh, I'm, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad that didn't pan out. Yeah. This, so <laughs> rather than taking that role, I ended up, uh, uh founding Flowcast. So I, I am somewhat happy that it went that route. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I was there for about a year and then moved on to Zephyr. So Zephyr, I was there for five and a half years, uh, came in, the company was about 120 people and they were shifting the business model and, and, just didn't have any finance leadership uh, at all. And so I was actually the first full-time finance person they hired. We hired a controller right after that. And, and that's one thing I wanted to talk about really fast. I mean, I, I do not have an accounting background. Yep. Um, I know a lot of people who listen to the podcast do, which is fantastic. But, you know, I had to learn enough to get to be dangerous on that side. Likewise, I brought in a very strong controller who I actually needed to help me with other things outside of, of accounting. And so she had to learn that along the way as well. What are, what are some examples of, of that? So, I mean, it, kind of taking some of the classic FP&A type of things in terms of budgeting, uh, some forecasting and reporting. Um, I put a lot of the reporting on her because we had to be more buttoned up than we were. And while I could handle a lot of the forecasting and so on, um, there was enough reporting, whether it was investor relations or you know, directly to the board of directors or to just internally, we needed to have different types of reporting with different levels of detail and, and really different uh, uh, levels of explanation and so on. And so she started learning how to do that, which I think was really valuable for her and for sure. of course yeah. helped me tremendously. So um, I, I think w w the lesson there was, I mean, I knew what I knew and I knew what I didn't know, which was I didn't have strong accounting. So the first thing I did was very much hire that piece that could really complement. Uh, and that's, that. that's really cool that she got broad exposure to those different areas. And, 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 you know, even from her perspective, she might not become a budgeting expert. You know, it might stay fairly high level and you have the right. startup budgeting, which is very different than when all of a sudden you have 500 employees and you're, right. you know, di different budgeting. Um, but that should, that should position her pretty well for, for moving up. Um, and I mean, it's really because she decided to take the risk and join a startup. That's right. right. Like that's, that's what gave her the opportunity to, to get exposure to all of that. Yeah. And I was, I was super lucky cause she was, uh, coming off, a uh, another, yeah, what was her, what was her background? I'd, I'd love to learn yeah, more about her. Yeah, her background she had, um, I forget what firm she, she worked in, but she worked at a, an accounting firm and then had worked at a few startups in the ad tech world. And uh, the last one she was at just wasn't working out very well. Um, and then I think she had taken maternity leave and was coming back. So the timing was just great yeah. uh, for, for us. And we really lucked out uh, in terms of her, her skills. She was uh, you know, incredibly strong given the level of where we were as a company. But, that, but it really did allow us to very quickly get systems in place and processes in place which then, you know, a year or two later allowed us to scale in ways that would have been a bit harder had we not put those things in place then. That's, uh, that's awesome to hear. All right. Well, any, uh, yeah, any other points you want to make on Zephyr here? No, it was, uh, it, it was a great experience. We scaled to, at one point, over 300 people. I think, I think one of the lessons learned there too, especially for a startup CFO, is it's about flexibility and it's about people, right? So, uh, on the one hand, you know, there's a lot of work that had to be done to, um, you know, on the finance and accounting side, but in, in a startup, at least the ones that I've seen and been a part of, the CFO ends up kind of being the catch-all for everything else. Yeah. And so in addition to finance and accounting, I was also responsible for HR and legal and facilities and insurance. And um, some at, at one point, I had part of the customer's you know, service organization reporting. Oh, wow. Okay. We did a couple small acquisitions and for some period of time they reported to me while we were integrating. So, you know, it's a little bit of, um, 
you know, the, uh, the, the jack, of, jack of all trades. And so to me, I love that because again, getting uh, uh, more exposure to more parts of the organization just meant that I could understand how things happened in the organization better and I could better impact them in, in positive ways. Uh, but it's certainly something to, to know that uh, if you wanna be part of a startup, uh, certainly in a CFO, VP finance role, you should expect to have some flexibility um, and, and need that flexibility to to grow within the role. Yeah, you're you're not necessarily going to have a fully rounded out executive team, right? Like that's right. A a chief customer officer might not make sense until right. a little a little bit later. That that makes a ton of sense. Um, and then, how did you end up at Play Versus? So uh, I was at Zephyr for five plus years, ready for something new. I love the people over there, but want to try something different. Went to a company called Nation Builder. Uh, for about a year. They are a SaaS company building out uh, pretty much a suite of tools for organizations to manage their constituents. So advocacy groups, political, political parties, political campaigns, nonprofits. Okay. Really interesting. But I, I was introduced to Delane, who's the CEO here at Play Versus, through the people at Science, which is a, an incubator here in L.A., uh, I'd actually work with Mike Jones and Tom Dare, who are two of the partners when I was at MySpace. Okay. And so yeah. uh, they reached out to me and said, Hey, you got to meet this guy. And I met Delane. I love the vision for what we're trying to do here at play versus and just couldn't pass up the opportunity. So uh, that was it. Um, yeah. And so at, at play versus, are you, it's a, it's a platform you've built and are you licensing that platform? I'm just interested yeah. in the going no, no, into the so, business. So yeah. it's a, uh, it's a platform. So it, we're still, quite early. I mean, I was, I think the 17th or 18th employee. So wow. fairly, fairly early to bring in a CFO, which I was very excited about because I think it's a great move. Like as a CEO, that, that would take so much off your plate. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think I've been able to do that to a degree and we need to grow quickly. And so I can help take care of some of the operational stuff while Delane and the team can focus on growing the product in the, in the market. So yeah, yeah we're a platform, we're a software platform and really we connect the games uh, to the players in the schools. Very cool. Okay. And then you're also a VC. I uh, see that. Of, yeah. So uh, Next Gen Ventures, it, I was, uh, they're originally based in DC. And what they did is really, really a smart, interesting model. They basically reached out to executives, investors, but primarily people working at companies, whether they're founders or executives, to be um, venture partners for them and basically be their, their eyes and ears for deal flow and then uh, to help vet ideas. So the, the organization has its own uh, fund and then it allows uh, venture partners to invest alongside that fund into deals. And so it's been oh, a really okay. interesting opportunity to, for me to talk to companies that I wouldn't otherwise see, to potentially invest in companies I wouldn't otherwise see. And um, you know, to be part of these investment committees has just been a fascinating experience. So haven't done a ton with it, but it's been, it's been really fun. That's becoming a VC is something I've always found really interesting be because of that learning experience. Like I've always talked to my co-founders about how, if you're the VC on the other side of the table, when I'm pitching you, right, I've like poured my life into learning about this topic and this business and, right. and everything. Right. And you get to sit there for an hour and learn about everything I've accumulated in the last like That's 10 right. years. Working. And that's such a cool, the learning experience there is, has always been fascinating to me. And uh, so it sounds like you agree with that. And it's yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, I think what, what I've been doing is very much, uh, you know, just uh, uh, dabbling a bit in it, but it's been really interesting and fun. That's fun. Um, all right. Well, the last topic I'd like to cover off on before we, before we wrap it up is I always find it interesting to sort of think about when you want to position, you know, transition out of play versus there's going to become a day where you want to, you know, maybe, maybe try a new opportunity. Um, so let's fast forward. Let's say play versus just kills it in the next four years. Um, you hit all your milestones. Can you tell me like broadly what the business looks like? And then let's say you're like, Hey, this is scaled up. I'm ready to try my next startup and you want to hire your replacement. Like what, what would that replacement look like and what would you be searching for? So I, I would look for someone who, you know, at that point, um, someone who has scaled companies. So I think there's a, you know, there's, there's skill sets for scaling, you know, for coming in early 
and kind of just doing everything for everyone. There's a skill set for being at a later stage, like late stage or public company where it's much, much higher level kind of like classic CFO work. Yeah. Uh, and then there's something in between, which is someone who has scaled companies. And so for me, I'd probably look for someone who has, who has worked at uh, multiple types of companies, but ideally has experience uh, having scaled companies so that they understand what they are inheriting essentially. So um, even three, four, five years from now, if we are gr growing into a, a large company, we will have scaled massively. And so some understanding yeah. what that has meant to the organization, what kinds of things need to be thought about in terms of going back and making sure that as we've scaled, it's been in the right way. Are there things that need to be uh, adjusted or changed? And then how to look forward and, and deal with investors uh, and you know the the market you know depending on either even if it's private markets just really thinking through how to how to position the company someone who's had that experience I think will be really important and then someone who um, really understands that finance is kind of part of the narrative of a company um, it's not it's not an output um, I think this is something that one of my professors at business school a guy named Mihir Desai talked about. It, it, yeah. I don't know if you talked talk about it explicitly or if this is just what I took out of it, but really that, that finance accounting is not, it's not the back office. It's, just, it's part of the whole and that the data, the, how you present it uh, is really part of the narrative for a company. So someone who understands that can appreciate that. Um, I think that's a really interesting and important skill set to have. Yeah. Like that. So now that you say that I've always thought that, yeah, the output is kind of, that's, that's the narrative of the business as we've done this. And then we have an output and that's, those were the results, but kind of flipping it on the, the FP&A side. I just remember early on for, let's say the first three or four years of Flowcast history, I was the, I did all the FP&A. Right. And so I'm literally in a spreadsheet, like I'm going to spend $15,000 in September. So let's put $15,000 in September. And I got a lot of grief from my investors when they found out I was doing that because they thought it was a, a waste of my time basically. And I tried to explain that when you're doing that, it's actually, it's actually a very great planning exercise. And I have to think through every dollar we're going to spend in my head and see if it makes sense. And it's almost like putting a business plan together. And like, that's what helped me kind of think through strategy was the finance side. Um, so hmm, I kind of just did that. Yeah. But that's a, that's a really interesting way to think about it. Yeah. And then scaling, this has always been an interesting question to me. So like, we're saying, hey, we want to see someone who scales. Is that scaling on like a revenue basis or is that thinking about the number of employees we have? Is so so the, I think the answer is, is yes. The way I think about scaling is um, helping a company grow into increased complexity. Right. So, and yeah. that could be in terms of revenue and revenue streams. Right. If you have like one revenue stream and a fairly simple organization, um, scaling is very different than suddenly having multiple products, multiple revenue streams, multiple types of business lines and, you know, international is very different uh, than having just yeah. domestic. So, so someone who has seen those kinds of uh, things and, and it could, it, depending on where we end up, the type of person, the type of experience could be different. Uh, but really the, the ability to uh, work with increased complexity is really how I think of scale. And then for you, for you personally, you know, I, I know you mentioned you like the startup world, like is, have you decided I like startups and we'll scale this up and I want to find my next startup or have, or is this an adventure you want to, you want to stay on and learn about what this looks like? Well, I mean, I, I certainly want to stay here as long as I, I can. This is such a great fit for me personally, from an interest perspective, as well as just the team and what the company's trying to do. I, I just see huge potential. So I'd like to stay here as long as possible, but I really do love startups. I love working uh, within them. I, I love the decision-making process. I mean, the thing I, I really enjoy is that uh, right or wrong, you can make very quick decisions and then very quickly pivot if you need to. Yeah. And that's so hard to do in very large organizations or public organizations, which are really built to make sure that you, uh, once you get on a path, you can maintain that path in a positive way. Startups don't have that luxury. And so you have to be able to move quickly. And I, I love that process. Yeah. I, uh, I love that process as well. Um, awesome. Well, let's, let's wrap it on. Let's wrap it up on that note. I want to see, you know, just from your perspective, like what, what's one final tidbit you'd like the audience to, to take away from the interview? Um, look, I, to me, 
you know, I think finance and accounting and the CFO role is really um, so critical to an organization. And it really, I, I think it takes someone who wants to be um, a, a kind of integrated part of the whole. Um, and, and that's that's how I think about finance and, and the role and all that. And so I think if there's anything to take away, it's that uh, if you can do that successfully, I think um, as a CFO, you'll find a lot of a lot more uh, fulfillment in in your jobs and in your companies, wherever wherever it takes you, startup or larger or public company. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for for joining us today. That was awesome. Um, and if you love esports and you happen to live in Los Angeles, I'm sure Gabby will be hiring at some point. So uh, re re reach out to him. And I believe you're in Venice, correct? Uh, we're actually in Santa Monica. Santa Monica. All right. So whatever. It's it's Close all enough. it's all great places. Yeah, over over on the west side. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate your time. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. All right. Have a great day. You too.